Hello stats enthusiasts, Goldie here, and I am ready to dive into note 7 in our unit 6. So unit 6 is all about inference for categorical data, focusing on proportions. And in note 7 today, we are going to be talking about the confidence intervals for a difference in proportions. And we're going to look at a problem where we actually will use this inference method. So I'm excited to show you, so pull up a chair and let's get right into the content. Before we make a confidence interval for a difference in proportions, I just want to recall why we are comparing two proportions. Our last two set of notes here deal with comparing two proportions, one for a confidence interval and one for a significance test. So let's remember kind of why we are doing this for two proportions. Um, comparing them um, based on two random samples or two randomized experiments is actually one of the most common situations we encounter. We see this in two, um, two scenarios, when we want to determine whether two treatments caused an observed difference, or we want to draw a conclusion about um, these two populations for all subjects. So comparative studies um, are the most common statistical practice. So that's why we are going over confidence intervals and significance tests for comparing both of them. Now, in order to create a confidence interval, which is what we are going to do in this section of notes, we first have to create our sampling distribution of p hat sub 1 minus p hat sub 2. The good news is we already did this. We already created our sampling distribution of a difference. We get to pull this information back with us. Now, the reason we're pulling it back with us is because we have to have three conditions met. And as long as these three conditions are met for the sampling distribution, we can create our confidence interval. So remember, we have p hat sub 1 and p hat sub 2 that represent the sample proportions from each group. The shape of the combined difference is going to be approximately normal as long as both distributions satisfy the large counts condition. So for a confidence interval, you have to check that your first proportion times your n um, are equal, um, or excuse me, are greater than or equal to 10, and that's your second sample size and your p sub 2 um, multiplied successes and failures are greater than or equal to 10. Now this is for a sampling distribution, so we use p sub 1 and p sub 2, our population values. We are not going to know those population values in a confidence interval. So when we make our confidence interval, we're going to check this condition with p hat sub 1 and p hat sub 2 just like we did with our confidence intervals um, for just a single proportion, okay? Our center is going to be the difference, <laughs> okay? As long as both samples either have been randomly selected from the population or use random assignment in an experiment. We have to have that randomization in there. And finally, our spread. Remember, the spread was this exciting formula that we created um, and we were able to use this formula as our spread as long as both samples satisfied the 10% condition and they only had to satisfy the 10% condition when sampling um, because that 10% condition is used when you are randomly sampling without replacement from a finite population. When you randomly sample without replacement, you want to make sure that your sample size is low enough compared to the population that sampling does not affect your proportion of successes. Okay? It does not influence that in any way. So we have to check only for sampling. We do not have to check for an experiment. And in fact, if you do check that for an experiment, you will be marked off for it on the AP exam because it is only for sampling. Okay. So that is our sampling distribution, and that leads us into creating a confidence interval for a difference between these two proportions, these two um, proportions that we have. So remember the skeleton for a confidence interval is our statistic plus or minus our critical value times our standard deviation. So our statistic is going to be the center of our sampling distribution. Our critical value is the same critical value we've been working with. It's gonna be Z star, and it's gonna be found the exact same way that it has been found in this unit. And then our standard deviation is actually gonna become our standard error because we don't know what our um, true population value is. We're gonna to have to use sample data to estimate our standard deviation, and that switches it to our standard error. 
So when all of those conditions are met, those three conditions we just went over, uh, an approximate C percent confidence interval for a difference in these sample proportions, okay, because we're going to get sample data and if we find the difference between the two, this is going to be our confidence interval. So the statistic is the difference between the two sample proportions, plus or minus Z star, Z star being related to C percent as it's always been. And then we have our standard error. We use p hat sub one and p hat sub two because we don't know our population values. And then a little note here, remember z star is that critical value where c percent is between negative z star and positive z star, found just like we have always found it. On your AP statistics formula sheet, uh, remember this is what it currently looks like. Um, our confidence interval skeleton is right up here where we have statistic plus or minus a critical value times the standard error of your statistic. And now we're gonna be jumping down here for two proportions. We were right here for one proportion, <laughs> but now we're here for two proportions, okay? Two proportions. Um, here's our standard error right here, okay? So we're gonna put that standard error into this. Our critical value is found as always. And you can see that um, this is our sampling distribution. Uh, so when we put our statistic in there, we use statistic values, p hat sub one minus p hat sub two. We do not use our parameter values. Now, what is this, Goldie, right here? Well, this is going to be for significance testing, and we're gonna cover this in the next set of notes. So don't worry about that part right now. We're gonna talk about that in the next set of notes. Just know that this piece specifically is going to apply to confidence intervals for a difference in sample proportions, okay? And that brings us to our example for this. So in this example, it's a two proportion Z interval is what it is called, or a two prop Z int. And this is gonna say a recent survey wanted to compare the proportion of teenagers and adults who use social media. The first poll asked a random sample of 300 teenagers if they use social networking sites and 400 adults, the same question. In these two sites, 92% of teenagers use social networking and 75% of adults did. Construct and interpret a 95% confidence intervals for the difference between the proportions of all US teens and adults who use social networking sites. So when you're looking at an inference problem um, and you're trying to decide which inference method to use, um, language like, you know, confidence level, confidence interval and um, uh, convincing evidence let you know whether you are actually making a confidence interval or if you're running a significance test. Um, same thing if you're trying to decide between one pr proportion and two proportion, um, look at the language. Okay, sometimes they give you more um, information than necessary in problems. So I, I hesitate to say, look at the numbers. Um, look at the question that, they're, that they are asking. They're asking you to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the difference, okay? And when you see for the difference between the proportions, know that, okay, this is the inference method I am running. I am running a two proportion Z interval for the difference, okay? So we set that up with our four C's. Our first C is communicate. So we are going to communicate some of the information in this problem. Um, we're going to communicate what P1 and P2 stand for. I use P1 and P2 throughout my problems. You can also just use like P sub T or P sub A for like proportion of teenagers, proportion of adults. It's fine to interchange those numbers with letters, no big deal. Um, but I use one and two, so we're gonna keep it that way. We also wanna communicate what our Z star value is. So what is our percent confident, percent, percent confident interval that we are creating? And then what's our Z star that's going to correspond to that? So 95% is 1.96. And that's really all you need to communicate for a confidence interval. The second step is conditions, okay? we have to check our conditions. First one is our random condition. We have to make sure that both samples were randomly selected and they told us that in the problem. So write down just both samples were randomly selected. We're good. Independent, we have to check our 10% condition here because they did select a random sample. And so we say 300 is less than 10% of all teenagers. 
400 is less than 10% of all adults. Perfect. That checks out. Okay. That is definitely a true statement. So we write that down, comment that it's true, and then we move on to our normal um, condition, which is going to be large counts. And here we use our, um, our sample proportions. Okay. So the sample proportion P hat sub one is 0.92 and p hat sub 2 for adults is 0.75 okay so that's why we do n1 times p hat sub 1 and then we do n n1 times 1 minus p hat sub 1 and we make sure that both of those values are greater than or equal to 10 and re we repeat it for the adults okay the adult group both um, are greater than or equal to 10. Okay. We check that, it's good, checks out, so all of our conditions are met, and we can proceed to the next C, which is calculate. Okay. And now in the calculate part, um, we want to communicate what inference procedure we are doing. We are doing a two-proportion Z interval, or you could also name it with the what I call the skeleton formula, um, which is just the values that you are going to use. And then we're, we'll plug all of our values in. Okay. And we have all of these values. I just said that P hat sub one is 0.92 and P hat sub two is 0.75. I know that N1 is 300 because we took a random sample of 300 teenagers and N2 is 400. And I already found Z star to be 1.96. So I'm gonna put all of those into my formula, and then I can find my confidence interval. Now from here, you don't have to show the algebra, you don't have to do step-by-step, -step showing your work, simplifying. Um, you can do this by hand on your calculator, uh, or you can just run um, the test on your calculator, or I say test, but you can run this inference procedure, run this confidence interval on your calculator, and then just write down the confidence interval that your um, calculator gives you. Okay. So two options there. I'll explain how to use the calculator for this um, right after this problem. But if I do this, I get 0.17 plus or minus that value, or I get this interval. Okay. Or I get this interval. And that's all I got to do for calculate. That is the work that must be shown. Um, on the AP exam, they want either this or this. I liked writing out both. Um, they definitely want to see that your values plugged in. They want to see this. Um, and then from there, they don't need to see any other algebra work. They just want to see your um, confidence interval. Okay. And then we have to finish with our conclude part. What does this mean? We are 95% confident that the true difference between the proportions of teenagers and adults who use social media is between 0.1176 and 0.2224. Okay. And that's all we need to do. We don't have to draw any extra conclusions. It didn't ask anything about a claim or a hypothesis test um, claim. So we just interpret what the confidence interval is, um, brush off our hands and are done with it. Now, to do this on the calculator, on the TI-84, um, this is going to be under all of the testing page. It's letter B. It's two prop Z interval is what it's going to be. It's going to ask for your values of X1, N1, X2, N2, and then your confidence level as a decimal. And it's going to return what your confidence interval is, as well as your P hat sub 1 and your P hat sub 2 value. Now remember, p hat sub 1 is just x1 over n1. Oops, yep. And p hat sub 2 is that same thing. It's x2 over n2. Now in our problem, we were actually given the p hat values as decimals right away. We were not given our x values at all. But when we put in our values for the calculator, we need to put in those x values. So to put in our x value, I would take 0.92 times 300 to get that x value that I need to put into my calculator. This is something I just have to do if I'm using the calculator. You do not actually have to show this work at all on a 
regular problem. This is just if you're using your calculator because your calculator wants this as your x1. It does not take 0.92. In fact, it takes no decimals for your x value. So if you ever were to multiply these and you get a decimal, you have to round. Otherwise, your calculator will give you an error. So we do that same thing for x2. 0.75 times 400 means that 300 adults out of 400 said that they use social media sites. And then our confidence level was 0.95. We put all that into the calculator. So this is what it looks like. Okay. Click calculate and it gives us that confidence interval. Okay. Now you don't have to write out five, these five significant figures. Um, three to four significant figures is plenty. Um, but I wanted to show you that it rounded to the exact um, values we found by hand. Okay. If it is off by a little bit, that's fine. That's just a rounding error that happens when we are doing it by hand on the calculator versus running the calculator test. Um, if you were to ever round this value, if you were to multiply these and not get a whole number, you would have to round that. And that is also going to give us some rounding error that, that would be different than finding it by hand. All of these little differences in rounding errors, an AP examiner um, would understand and expect to happen, okay? So don't get super caught up on, you know, oh my gosh, I got 1.1173 as opposed to 0.1176, okay? Those little errors are just due to rounding, and as long as you show and communicate all your work, you will get full credit for it. And that wraps up today's lesson on confidence intervals for a difference in proportions. We are one video away from the end of this unit. That's going to be in notes eight, where we talk about a significance test for a difference in proportions. That's going to be the next video in the series. So make sure to tune in for that. As always, if you have liked this video, please click the like button and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more great AP stat content. I wish you endless statistical success in your journey to learning statistics, and I will see you in the next video.